key concept that always seems to fly over horror villains' heads is just how badly their victims want to live. For one reason or another, this curtain call of villains all found themselves completely unprepared for the events that invariably resulted in their imminent deaths. I'm Jess from What Culture, and here are 10 horror movie villains who were completely unprepared. Number 10. The Strangers. The Strangers Pray at Night. In all fairness to the titular strangers of the franchise's second offering, Prey at Night, most aspiring slasher baddies would likely be caught off guard by a pair of teenagers who fought back with the ferocity demonstrated by the film's sibling protagonist, Luke and Kinsey. The second stranger's outing saw the premise reimagined by director Johannes Roberts, as the family are terrorized while visiting a trailer park on vacation. The original was more of a psychological horror, while Prey at Night falls more within the bounds of the slasher subgenre, featuring considerably more action. The film also chillingly utilizes a soundtrack of songs that would be more appropriate in a karaoke bar, as opposed to the backing music for a group of bloodthirsty killers. Unfortunately for the masked murderers, the three villains turn out to be wholly unprepared for the level of resistance they find themselves faced with from the aforementioned teenagers. In the film's superbly shot pool fight scene, Luke brutally stabs Pinup Girl to death before going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the masked man, despite the latter wielding an axe. Luke is wounded and taken out of the action, but the strangers are no more prepared to deal with his sister. Kinsey gets the upper hand over Dollface and executes her before seemingly dispatching the masked man with a baseball bat to the dome. While the fate of the psychotic murderer is left deliberately ambiguous, the fact that the strangers picked the wrong family for a nice easy murder spree out is not. Number 9. The Man. Hush. One would assume that donning a mask and a crossbow before embarking on a sadistic murder spree would involve at least a little bit of forward planning. But John Gallagher Jr.'s sadistic killer, billed only as The Man in 2016 sleeper hit Hush, clearly does not ascribe to such methods. Viewers meet the taut horror's central antagonist as he murders protagonist Maddie's best friend Sarah on her porch. Maddie is deaf mute and as such does not witness Sarah's gruesome murder. The man swiftly discovers Maddie's affliction, much to his abhorrent delight, and what subsequently ensues is a twisted, nail-biting game of cat and mouse as the psychotic killer stalks Maddie in and around her house. Ultimately, however, this is what foils Gallagher's depraved killer. His pursuit of Maddie is entirely improvised and unplanned. While possessing what might be deemed to be an unassailable advantage based on Maddie's condition, the man's on-the-fly plan means that he's dismally prepared for the horror author's levels of ingenuity and sheer determination. After being relieved of and then shot in the shoulder with his own crossbow, the man gets his nasty final shock when he attempts to sneak up on Maddie, but accidentally alerts her by breathing on her, allowing her to spear him through the throat with a corkscrew. Due to her condition, Hush's villain clearly viewed Maddie as easy prey and was completely unprepared for the notion that he might lose this dance of death. Number 8. Peter Wayland, Prometheus on paper, Prometheus's Peter Wayland is about as prepared as they come. Investing astronomical amounts into an attempt to discover alien life, Wayland's expedition to contact an extraterrestrial race known as the Engineers is meticulously planned and executed. Even in the silence of space, the titular ship practically groans under the weight of all the state-of-the-art gear the vessel carries, from vehicles and science equipment all the way to flamethrowers for unwelcome alien visitors. Michael Fassbender's hair-raising cyborg David is even able to communicate with the engineers through an amalgamation of archaic human languages. Wayland's failure to adequately prepare lies at the very heart of the reason for his voyage. There was no plan B in the event of a catastrophic first contact. For somebody as fixated on discovering life beyond Earth as Wayland, Guy Pearce's ancient billionaire seemingly failed to comprehend the distinctly probable possibility that a previously uncontacted race of aliens might react unpredictably, perhaps even wildly, to an unannounced human incursion. It seems obvious, but Wayland, singularly focused on discovering the secret to immortality, completely ignores this basic premise of space exploration. As such, it is very little surprise that all the technology and money in the world does little to prevent one of the engineers from decapitating David and using his severed head to bludgeon the elderly CEO of the Wayland Corporation to death. Based on his preparation for the potential pitfalls of meeting a terrifying otherworldly being, it's likely that Wayland barely knows noticed his skull being caved in. Number 7. The Cyber Cultists Christy 
Somewhat confusingly, Christy follows the story of a young woman named Justine, who finds herself targeted seemingly without reason by a shadowy murderous cyber cult. Said cult murder affluent religious women who they refer to as Christies, before posting video evidence of their heinous crimes online. Christy is derived from the phrase follower of Christ in Latin. Four masked members burst onto the scene at Justine's campus and murder the small skeleton crew of staff left behind. The unfortunate girl is the only one unable to afford a trip home for Thanksgiving and finds herself alone and stalked by the sociopathic intruders led by the sinister Violet. The cultists, however, are completely caught napping for what comes back in their direction. Despite being outnumbered four to one, the apparently unimposing Justine savagely takes the fight to the would-be executioners. The sheer brutality of the manner in which Justine kills the intruders is darkly ironic, considering the fact that she's the one being hunted by them. Various unfortunate cult members find themselves splattered with cars, viciously stabbed to death with a set of car keys, and brained with a baseball bat by their purported prey. Violet can be barely believe her eyes as a vengeful Justine emerges from the carnage to burn her alive before uploading a shot of her smoldering corpse to the cult's website, setting a new precedent for not to be f with. These would-be ritualistic killers thought this would be a piece of cake, and they had absolutely no idea just how dangerous their latest target was. Number 6. The Purges The Purge while no expert on the subject, the writer of this article would posit that those planning on invading the homes of others on Perch Night, armed with vicious weaponry and murderous intentions, would expect a certain level of resistance. Nobody likes being dragged out of bed and murdered in the middle of the night by a gang of bloodthirsty psychopaths. And yet, the first indicator of the Purge's complete lack of readiness for their sadistic rampage is the fact that despite the Purge being based in America, the intruders actually carry relatively little firepower. You might recall that iconic scene from Indiana Jones. An axe or similar implement may look good and terrifying, but it's no match for a loaded gun. The Purges also proceed to laugh and merrily make their way around the inside of the Sandin house in the franchise's first movie with the abandon and restraint of a child skipping around a playground. Granted, giving each other piggybacks and giggling wickedly as they go about their sinister business gives them a distinctly terrifying unhinged aura. But what happens when they actually run into one of the house's residents? Lo and behold, James Sandin does not see the funny side of matters and obliterates a pair guilty of the aforementioned offenses with a shotgun. The the final and perhaps most egregious instance of poor preparation from the Purges is the manner in which they allow themselves to be taken by surprise and killed by the Sandin's neighbors. A fairly basic rule of Purge Night, don't forget, you are not the only people purging. Number 5. The Grabber. The Black Phone. The Grabber, Ethan Hawke's twisted take on a masked serial child murderer, is the primary antagonist of 2021's The Black Phone. The film begins in the midst of a spree of recent child abductions, and the police simply cannot find Hawke's elusive predator. It's a great story, the problem is just how unbelievable it is. The Grabber is an almost spectral force, able to swoop in and seize a child before disappearing in a figurative puff of smoke, leaving the boys in blue scratching their heads. The issue is the sharp juxtaposition between the Grabber Grabber's actions within the film and his terrifying, almost untouchable aura of menace. Hawk's antagonist wastes no time in highlighting just how spectacularly unprepared he was for a long-term turn as a terrifying kidnapper. In the first instance, the cretinous villain is revealed to have hidden his latest victim and the film's protagonist Finney in the same house as his brother Max, who is somehow blissfully unaware of both the young boy in the basement and of how dense he and his brother are. Does any of this scream well prepared? The Grabber also somehow manages to fall asleep on duty, as one does when they have an abducted person locked in their basement, allowing Finney to nearly escape. Hawk's murderer ultimately is tricked into falling into a hidden pit, after essentially losing a brawl with a scrawny teenager, and is strangled by Finney with a phone cable. Number 4. Darcy. Green Room. One quite literally does a double take when they realize that the leader of the barbaric group of neo-Nazi skinheads in Green Room is none other than Sir Patrick Stewart. Stewart's psychopathic Darcy is notable for being one of his more unorthodox roles, as well as a horror villain entirely unprepared for the dangers posed by a cornered animal. The 2015 film's protagonist, the punk band The Ain't Rights, find they've accidentally been booked to play a gig at a neo-Nazi bar. Rather unsurprisingly for such a charming establishment, they soon witness a murder and are locked in the bar's titular green room with Amber, a friend of the deceased. 
Darcy's plan is simple, dead witnesses don't squeal. On paper, musicians don't make for the most formidable of adversaries, so it's understandable that Darcy's taken by surprise at just how much of a fight the vastly outnumbered group put up. Even when only Amber and the bassist Pat remain, he remains oblivious to the notion that he might somehow lose this battle, leaving the bar to stage the dead band members' bodies on his land as trespassers before he's even had confirmation that the final two are dead. Darcy's supreme intelligence and cunning make his complete lack of preparation for just how stubbornly Pat and Amber refuse to die all the more delicious. Despite always being used to being one step ahead, the skinhead leader finds himself cornered by the vengeful pair in the film's finale. Quite literally unable to comprehend the turn of events, Darcy walks away in disbelief before being gunned down. Number 3. The Predator – Prey the Predator from the franchise's latest installment, Prey, was as prepared as conceivably possible for a hunting trip. Possessing cloaking technology, effectively rendering it invisible and bristling with early versions of the weaponry fans have grown to love over the years, the extraterrestrial hunter appears to be an absolutely invincible adversary. Unfortunately for the Predator, however, it was woefully unprepared for the prospect of a creature that could outwit it. In this case, a young Comanche girl named Naru. While attempts to meet the Predator head-on end in predictable screams of agony and the sound of sickening crunches as bodies are ripped apart, the protagonist here takes a leaf out of Arnie's book, relying on cunning and guile. Naru first realizes that the creature's targeting system, in addition to being based on heat, is housed within its mask. The resourceful young woman eats herbs that lower her body temperature before meeting the fearsome being head-on, and the predator soon finds itself missing an arm and mired in a muddy bog. In addition to not being prepared for prey possessing such a level of intellect, it was evidently not expecting to be attacked with such unabated ferocity. It's therefore wholly unsurprising that the Predator is unprepared for Naru's final flourish. The creature attempts to finish her off without realizing that Naru has positioned its mask and targeting system in the bog, and subsequently shoots itself in the head. The Predator was clearly ready for a bloody fight, less so for a battle of wits. Number 2. Hogue and his gang. No one lives. It becomes glaringly obvious in short order that the villainous Hogue and his group of criminal miscreants from 2012's No One Lives are hopelessly unprepared for the unstoppable force of evil that they encounter, embodied by Luke Evans' foreboding driver. With that being said, even in their wildest nightmares, it's hard to envision a scenario in which they could have adequately readied themselves for the consequences of their kidnap. The hapless gang abduct what they believe to be a wealthy couple, the driver and a young woman named Betty. An additional young girl is soon discovered in the trunk of their car who is revealed to be Emma Ward, a wealthy young socialite who mysteriously vanished from the scene of a horrendous mass murder. Hogan Co. put two and two together far too late. Evans' seemingly innocuous driver is none other than the perpetrator of the appalling massacre. While the gang are hardened criminals, in particular the shockingly violent Flynn, they're totally unprepared for the level of merciless carnage that the driver inflicts upon them. Evans' ruthless killer goes through the unfortunate villains like a hot knife through butter despite their best efforts. All are invariably dispatched in cartoonishly violent manner by the implacable murderer. No One Lives gives terrifying new meaning to the phrase wolf in sheep's clothing. But in kidnappers would be advised to take notes. For the love of God, check the trunk. Number 1. The Masked Intruders. You're next. Your Next is essentially the horror movie equivalent of entering a local mini golf tournament with high hopes of winning only to find oneself face to face with Tiger Woods for the film's villains. Imagine the worst family reunion you've ever been to, except said reunion features Tarantino-esque levels of wince-inducing bloodshed. The Davison family find themselves under attack by a group of animal mask-wearing sadists who gleefully set about slashing and chopping the unfortunate residents to death. As the story unfolds, it becomes apparent that the events were orchestrated by younger sibling Felix and his girlfriend Z in an inheritance scam. It's fairly basic preparation for anyone invested in their evil plan enough to hire a group of murderers to have done a little bit of research on who was actually going to be in the house, but evidently not for the wicked duo. This particular shortcoming gets even more egregious when one considers that the character in question is none other than the girlfriend of middle sibling Crispian, who's also revealed to be complicit in the plot, the initially unassuming Aaron. 
Erin is revealed to have spent her formative years amongst a group of survivalists, training her in guerrilla warfare and endowing her with a formidable iron streak. The villains fail to realize they've essentially got a female iteration of John Rambo on their hands and as such are dispatched gorily with utensils, including a tenderizer and a blender. A clear lesson in why one should try and make conversation with their siblings significant others, one never knows what might come up in conversation. That's the end of our list, but do let me know down in that comment section if you can think of any other horror movie villains who were completely unprepared. As always, I've been Jess for What Culture Horror. Thank you so much for joining me. If you like, you can come say hi to me on my Twitter account where I'm at Jess McDonald. But make sure you stay tuned to us here for plenty more horror goodness.